Good morning and welcome to our online worship here at State Street United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Laura. So how's your walk with Jesus going? We're now in the third Sunday of Lent and I was thinking about, you know, when we hold our lives up to Jesus, we're all sinners but we are also reminded of the passion Jesus has for us. Jesus loves sinners so much, he's ready to give it all. Maybe that can give us enough courage, help us be brave, to show that same kind of love and compassion to others around us. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise the glories of my god and king the trials of his grace my gracious master and my god assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth and brought the honors of thy name. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the fire is clean, his blood avail for me. He speaks in listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken not rejoice, the humble poor. Your God, ye fallen race, Lord, can be saved through faith alone. Be justified by grace. See all your sins on Jesus laid. The Lamb of God was slain. His soul was once an offering made for Every soul in pain. Glory to God. As we enter into a time of prayer together, I do hope you will let us know if there is a way that we as the church family can be in prayer for you. Let us pray. O oh God of ever flowing grace, you fill our every need and satisfy our every hunger. As we come before you to feast on your goodness, our mouths are filled with praise for your wonderful name. From generation to generation, you have sustained your people. 
In the deserts of life, you bring forth springs of water. When we encounter the storms of life, you are our refuge. You nurture us as your own beloved, but we do not bear fruit. We are never satisfied. We seek out the comforts of this earth and do dishonor to you, the giver of every good gift. We are liable for judgment, for our guilt is great. Spare your wrath from falling on us, O merciful God. Forgive our sin and free us to follow with joy in your righteous ways. Led and sustained by your Spirit, your church has continued to this day. Anoint us with that same Spirit, that we may be your witnesses, calling the nations of the world to run to you, the Holy One of Israel. Your tender mercy and compassion extends beyond our ability to comprehend it. We commit to your loving care this day our loved ones, whom we have named and those who are on our hearts as we gather. O oh God, be their help. Take them in the shadow of your wings, uphold them with your right hand, and give them strength to bear their trials. Give healing to the sick, peace to the dying, and comfort all who mourn. And we ask all of these prayers in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray together his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Generous gifts, generous love, generous mercy, these are the characteristics of God. And as followers of Jesus, we get the chance to join in sharing that generosity in ways that others can also experience God's love and grace. When we give, things change. When we give, we change. Let us pray. God of wilderness and promised land, in days of want and in days of plenty, you have been with us. By the gifts we share, may others know of your providence and care. Send us not only our offerings, but our very selves to console and comfort, to lift up and reach out through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is found in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Hear the word of God. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was here, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, you are our rock 
and you are our Savior. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So it's NCAA basketball time, and that's often one of my favorite times of year. My husband and I are big fans. He's a Kansas University graduate, so his Jayhawks are usually part of the conversation. And having spent a lot of my ministry in the Knoxville area, the Lady Vols of Tennessee are very close to my heart. He and I have even attended the NCAA Women's Final Four in person twice, once when it was in St. Louis and the second time in Atlanta. People can get very passionate at this time of year about basketball, sometimes even if they have never watched it before. And that passion can sometimes turn to anger. Those people who wear the black and white stripes, the referees, their job is to keep the game as fair and under control as much as possible. They have to have tough skin. They get yelled at a lot. My husband even yells at them when we're listening to games on the radio. He's sure they're making the wrong call even when he can't see the game. During this Lenten season, we've been exploring the seven deadly sins, and on the surface, the sin of anger is the sin that is the most visible. It's hard to hide anger. Road rage, temper tantrums, red faces, out of control, physical altercations, expressions of anger. When we're angry, we say we've lost it lost our composure, lost our control. Anger can get pretty ugly. And we certainly don't think that anger belongs in church. Anger is not something we think of good Christians expressing. In church, we go out of our way to soothe ruffled feathers the voices that are the loudest and sometimes even the most obstinate are often the ones that get the most attention, maybe because we are uncomfortable. At a very young age, at least in predominantly white mainline churches, it is ingrained in us that church is the place where you are to sit quietly, to not make any disturbance, to not get too emotional. We are to put on our best outfit, our happiest face when we come to church. So what are we to do with this scripture passage from John? Jesus walks into a church and this is not just any place of worship. Jesus walks into the temple of Jerusalem, the very seat of religious honor and power. And he walks into the church during one of the most sacred times of year. The crowds are huge and they've journeyed from far and wide to be there for the Passover. And Jesus walks into a church makes a whip out of cords, and he throws the offering plates on the floor. He drives out the offering counters. He turns over the pews. He takes the holy and sacred items, driving out the animals whose sacrifice in this time of sacred worship is meant to honor and praise God. It would be like Jesus storming into our sanctuaries and clearing the altar of the cross, throwing the Bible on the ground, tearing off the paraments, maybe even breaking some of the stained glass windows. Imagine that scene. It would be horrible, the chaos. This is Jesus 
There is no other way to describe Jesus than angry. Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, is angry. And the object of his anger, what he's so passionate about, is people like you and me, the good, church-going folks. A lot of our anger these days seems to be directed outside of us at politicians, at Hollywood, at the extreme left or the radical right. But that's not how Jesus' anger is directed. Jesus' anger is directed at the good, God-fearing, active, church-going folks. Before Jesus is forgiving of us, Jesus is angry with us. Get out of here, he screams. Get out of God's house. You've made God's house into a den of thieves. And even though perhaps we would like to, we can't really just ignore this scene. We can't just say, you know, Jesus must have been having a bad day. Some have tried to argue that this just shows how human Jesus was, that Jesus lost it like we do from time to time. But this is not the first time, nor will it be the last, that Jesus expresses such deep emotions. Remember, Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus expressed deep agony and pain at the cross when he was in the garden. Jesus told Peter to get behind me, Satan. And this kind of passion is really not new for God. As Reverend Will Willimon, the author of Sinning Like a Christian says, the God of the scriptures is really not some cool, dispassionate, or detached bureaucrat just following the rules, treating everyone without regard or engagement. No, the prophets speak of God as a jealous God, a passionate lover, a God who has staked a great deal upon us, who cares deeply about us, who risks all for us and demands the best of us. The Jesus we see here, the God we see throughout the scriptures is a God of passion, a God who does not rest in the face of injustice, a God who exposes hypocrisy, who demands faithful worship. In other words, a God who cares, especially when the world is not as it should be, when human beings are not acting as God intends, when love is not being shown, when generosity is not being lived out when forgiveness is not offered, when people are hurting, when folks are crying out, when anyone is treated unfairly. God's anger is a righteous anger, an anger that stems from knowing the world is not as it ought to be. There shouldn't be people who are hungry in a world where God has provided enough for all to have something to eat. There shouldn't be people thirsty when God's streams of water flow so abundantly. There shouldn't be people who are imprisoned when redemption and transformation are possible for all. There shouldn't be hate when love is so strong this is the passionate cry of God. And this kind of righteous anger is motivational. That kind of righteous anger can move us, move us to want things to be better, to want things to change. 
Martin Luther said that it was this kind of righteous anger that drove him to some of his best work as a church leader. This priest who was one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation that launched a period of transformative growth for not only the Protestant churches, but also it could be argued provided some time of growth and strength for the Roman Catholic Church as well. His 39 theses that he posted on the door of the church emerged from the anger that he felt as the hypocrisy of the institutional church, a church that monetized sin, a church that built barriers between people and their own direct relationship and experience with God. But we do need to be careful with anger. Anger in human hands can be a very dangerous thing. As Willimon says, anger tends to drive us not in prophetic zeal as we see here with Jesus to write what's wrong with us and the world, but rather even deeper into ourselves in seething, simmering resentment. Part of anger sin is its isolation. It is in those moments when we are convinced that we are right and the world is wrong. Martin Luther defines sin as the heart all curved on itself. As Willimon continues, if there is one thing worse than anger enacted, it is anger nursed, turned inward, fed, nurtured. Anger is that paradoxical sin, which can be the engine that drives us to do our best, as it can be that which incapacitates us and leads us to do our worst. Perhaps that's why we are told that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Vengeance is not a gift that God provides us with. And we can even see that here in the story of Jesus's angry outburst. Jesus is constantly teaching, he's leading, he's showing the disciples, but he does not lead them to enact vengeance. He does not lead them to respond out of anger, even though that's what his disciples really hoped he would do. Their dream, their vision when they were marching into Jerusalem and hearing Jesus being proclaimed as king was that Jesus would lead them to overthrow the Roman government, to put down their enemies, to restore them to what they felt was their righteous authority and influence. Certainly, Jesus had that power. But that is not how Jesus lived out his righteous anger. This experience of sinning like a Christian is about holding our lives up to the way Jesus lived, to what Jesus offers, to what he gave. And especially as Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem, we are reminded, as Willimon says, that Every time we look at the cross of Christ, it is not only a mirror of us at our very worst, our angry, our murderous worst. The cross is also a window whereby we are able to peer into the deepest mystery of the heart of God. When God had a grand opportunity to strike out decisively in justified vengeance against humanity, God majestically forgave. As Willimon continues, when you think about it, when you really think about it, which is what we're asked to do during this 40-day Lenten journey, when you really let it sink in, 
The cross is, on the one hand, God's great rebuke of us. This moment when God holds us before this mirror that reveals who we are as sinners. None of us are immune from the power of sin. None of us are better than sin. But we also see that cross for who God really is as well. God cares enough about us to get angry enough with us and our sin to forgive, to offer us mercy, to save us. Even as we human beings are screaming at, yelling at, mocking the Savior of the world from that very cross, Jesus proclaims, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If God has that depth of love for us in a way that saves the world, doesn't it make sense that we can at least try and offer that same compassion and mercy to ourselves and to our neighbors, whom God loves just as much as God loves us? Can't God's love be enough motivation to give love and forgiveness and mercy the chance to do its work? This is the passion of the Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, in those moments when we are tempted to lash out, to turn inward into our own frustration and anger. Help us to lay it at your feet, to give it to you, to trust you. Help us think about the love and mercy you offer to us as we walk in this world and walk among others who are sinners just the same. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today for this time of worship together. And we do welcome you if you would like to join us in person. And I do ask you and have all of us be thinking about ways that we can mark this season, always remembering that most of all, we are marked with the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And I do pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray that the Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.